it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Nachiket Barve. Uh, Nachiket is a well-established you know, fashion designer. Uh, he recently won the national award for designing all the costumes in the film uh, Tanaji, the unsung hero. Uh, he's won the Woolmark you know, Prize. He has shown his designs uh, on, uh, on runways, both in India and abroad. And you know, today he's here to uh, not speak on how to make a fashion statement, but essentially how to make fashion into a statement. So Nachiket, the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. So firstly, thank you for all, uh, you know, showing up and being an amazing audience already. I think I'm a very unlikely candidate to be here because my origins could have been, couldn't have been further away from fashion than one can imagine. So everybody in my family is a doctor and our dinner table conversations do not involve couture or clothes or bags. They involve, uh, you know, perforated livers and, uh, you know, people getting colonoscopies, which is not exactly the most appetizing conversation. But uh, sometimes the apple does fall far from the tree and uh, I landed up in fashion. I thought today evening, rather than, you know, me uh, breaking fashion down into fundas or trying to kind of make it knowledge-based, I thought I'll just take you through my journey, take you through uh, my thinking process, you know, maybe inspire you in the, uh, in, in the process while we do that. And importantly, also, uh, you know, engage with you. You know, there is still, a, a fashion still is a mystical beast. You know, there is, you're either in or you're out, you're in style or you're out of style. It, it's considered a very hostile space where, you know, either you can sit with us or you can't sit with us. And I think that thinking needs to be shattered because at the end of the day, what we do is, is a, at least from my point of view, is a very welcoming, open embrace. You know, everybody has to uh, enjoy fashion. What is the purpose of fashion is something I ask myself many a time. And you know, is it to stand out in a room? Is it to express yourself? Is it to uh, create a brand differential? Perhaps it's all of those things. But most importantly, what fashion is, is a tool for joy. You know, it's a tool to bring happiness. It's a tool to bring functionality and utility into your lives where you feel you're presenting yourself as the best version of yourself. This is one of my favorite quotes, you know, it what? says, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And I think that just applies not just to fashion, but really through all of how we experience life itself. Fashion what? You know, like I said, like I, my beginnings couldn't have been uh, further removed from fashion than one can imagine. Can you go next, please? So that's me in the 80s, very inspired by God knows what the references were, but perhaps the remnants of Studio 54. So there is a psychedelic polyester shirt and uh, micro shorts, as you can see. But it's been a long process since. Yeah. And, you know, so I'll just kind of run you through the process. So I was born in Mumbai. I went to a very quaint, lovely school called Palitilak Vidyale. There was no, no semblance of fashion. There was no semblance of style. And people asked me, so with this background, how did you get to? And I have a very simple answer. The nurse who delivered me just dropped me on the floor. So that's where <laughs> I think something hit. And, you know, that's where we came from. I uh, passed through, sleepwalked through BCom because that was the sensible, logical thing to do. And uh, not one balance sheet ever tallied. So don't take business advice. Uh, not one, uh, you know, P&L statement tallied, but those for me were just numbers, you know, and what was life was little more than that. So after my 12th, I went and lived in New Zealand for a bit. And I worked at Burger King where I cleaned dishes. I did, you know, uh, won an award for employee of the month or something like that for making the fastest burger that one could do. But I think two important things that taught me was one, the value of hard work. Secondly, the dignity of labor, that the fact that you can do anything. And it harks back to a conversation I had as a child with my mother, you know. Uh, I remember there used to be a cobbler who used to mend shoes at the corner of the street we lived in. And while passing every day, I used to look at what he was doing. And, you know, it was very fascinating with all those instruments and the anvil and all of that. And I said, you know, mom, I want to be a cobbler. And she said, fine, be a cobbler, but be the best cobbler that there is. So that was a very important, uh, you know, guiding principle to kind of go through. And whether it was working at Burger King or whatever I do, I feel if you have that sense of wanting to do something correctly, whether somebody is watching or not watching, that takes you a long way. 
And you know, this picture is actually very interesting because that's me in, I think, 99 in Burger King when I was a teenager in New Zealand. And three years ago, I went back to New Zealand and there was a lady who worked there and she was still there and she was so happy to see me, you know. So it's really those fleeting moments of joy that you kind of treasure onto more than all the material belongings. These are sketches that I made. So I had that two years that I was in New Zealand, I had a lot of free time to, uh, you know, uh, learn by whatever the uh, BCom course that I was doing was. But it gave me a time to really express myself through what I was doing and really explore. So these are 98 as you can see and they're signed. After I came back, the first milestone happened in my life and my career, which was a, the support of my family who, although they don't understand the F of fashion, like they both, my parents both come from very, very, uh, you know, normal to underprivileged backgrounds. So just to take you a few decades back, my grandfather was in Konkan and he actually ran away from home and worked in somebody's house as a household help in Palghar to fill water and do stuff like that. And even one night there was a fight and he slept on, you know, Girgao Chaupati on the bench. And from then to supporting his family, Dad learned on a scholarship, mom learned on a scholarship. So for them, the height of fashion was, or what they understood was, you know, and Dadar at that point of time, and we are here in Dadar today, so it's full circle. You used to get saris which were in two parts. So it was the last remnants of a yardage of fabric, and they used to be stitched together, like in parts or whatever meterage was left. And those are, I think, six rupees or something like that. So they really came in from there. So I, when I see a lot of designers who are, bless them, have the privilege to grow up around fashion where they, you know, played with their mom, silk chiffon saris or whatever that it was that inspired them. And I didn't come from any of that, you know. So it's it's not like you have to, uh, you just, like, again, it comes back to the thing. It's not what you look at, it's what you see. A big step in my life happened when I had a chance to go to, uh, you know, NID in Ahmedabad. So after my 12th, I applied for design and I got through NIFT and NID both. And that was a very important step because for the first time you were kind of drawn into the world of design thinking where you looked at design as a problem-solving tool and something of utility. It was not something which was just frivolous, you know. So whether it is uh, you're talking about a certain shirt or a pocket square, these are all things that have got deeper, longer connections and it really taught you to do things. It taught you to learn by, you know, learn things by actual. And I've always been fascinated by the power of the hand. Not just that, also I think it inculcated a culture, a culture of, you know, of people. So whether it is you look at something like a craft form and that's something which has always guided my work through the years. And as a designer from India and as a designer in India, you know, we are really sitting on such a wealth of craft, a wealth of heritage, stuff that we just take for granted. And through my work, as we will hopefully aim to demonstrate through this presentation is there has to be a sense of awareness, a sense of education and a sense of pride in what we do. And that, that was something that I think NID sowed the seeds for. Not Emily, but Nachiket in Paris. So every NID had a, a scholarship where one student was sent to Paris on a scholarship awarded by the French government. And I was very lucky to get that. So that was another milestone because, you know, from the insular world of, say, being in Ville Parle and a certain kind of a milieu to then kind of going to Ahmedabad, which was like the world opening up in parts, to being in Paris where suddenly, you know, you are at the table with the best in the world. So whether it's the best editors, there's the best stylists, there's the best designers, there was a sense of the world absolutely opening up. And that is another important thing because of two things. So I had a chance to uh, study at Ecole des Arts Décoratifs and I were interned and worked at Celine, which is a, a brand under the Louis Vuitton Mohen Essay umbrella. And it was wonderful because we are talking, I mean, I'm not uh, telling you how geriatric I really am, but it was a time before the internet and before the big brands and the international magazines came to India. And to have that world open up at that point, I think set me right, you know, whether it was writing the press release a certain way or whether it was, uh, you know, communicating what you're doing in, the, uh, in, in your collection or whether it was the quality of craftsmanship. There was an attitude of absolutely no compromise and competing with the best, which I think was, was an important step. Launching the label. I remember a very important conversation I had when I was at the Celine Atelier, you know, and it was lunch break and we were all having our lunches by the Seine because it was a longish break. And everybody was talking about summer and how their grandmothers would be, you know, wearing Madras checks and going to the beach and stuff. And it stuck me at that point of time, how Indian I was, I really was because uh, my grandmother only ever wore a sari and that was a simple cotton one. And for me as an Indian designer in my 20s in Paris, to, it was a kind of an identity shift where I realized I'm not European. But I'm also not the India that the French thought we were, you know. So this was 
a few years after Devdas had released and all of that. So they were all about, oh, the Maharajas, magnifique and Bollywood, magnifique. And, you know, as if we all rode pink elephants to work every day. So that image of the exotic kind of India and then what was absolutely European, it made me acutely aware that I was an Indian, but with a global mindset, with a global platform and an opportunity to do something that would represent that generation of today. So in 2007, I applied for the Gen Next platform at Lakme Fashion Week and launched the label. This was the first collection. It was called Kutyo Alio and it was inspired by Audrey Hepburn. It, it started with the idea of taking Indian craftsmanship and really applying it in a way where these clothes could be worn in London, New York, Kyoto, or even Singapore. So like a dress like that, that you see the gray bias cut one is, it takes something like, I remember at that point, like about 375 hours of handwork. So it was silk and it's about 18 meters of silk. So it was the quietest, most minimal luxury in its own way that I always, even today, I believe that, you know, luxury should whisper and not shout. And that is what the funda behind all the clothes was. What is amazing to note and I'm very proud of is we still do orders on these clothes. So when people have kind of come to the idea of fast fashion or any of that now, that's been a guiding principle in what I've been doing through the years. These are some of the other snippets of the collections over the years when we were doing a lot of Western wear. You know, it was, and then, you know, I think also what it made me realize was how similar people are across the world, you know. I mean, we all want to look our best, feel our best, feel a sense of joy when we kind of engage with fashion. Storytelling to fashion. So, what are clothes? I mean, you know, you put on a pair of shirt or you pair of, you know, uh, add, a, buy a new pair of shoes. Those are just the, that's the end result. I think what's exciting as a designer and as a design entrepreneur is the journey, is the thought process. It's what elevates objects from being more than the sum of their parts. So I'll just take you quickly through some of the collections. So this is a collection called Chiaroscuro, which uh, in Italian is light and shadow, as you would know. And, you know, it was inspired by the whole idea of gothic beauty of churches, of Hitchcock, of a lot of those elements which were kind of carried forward through black and white. And as a designer, I've always believed in working with Indian techniques, celebrating Indian craft, you know. Even something as modest as, say, the gajra. I mean, you know, you have a gajra wali at every corner and it's, we just kind of take it, you know, for granted, like this is how it's made, but it's a piece of craft. It takes skill, knowledge, aptitude to be able to take three pieces of string and weave flowers and create an object of classicism and beauty out of it. So the whole idea of light and shadow or the whole idea of how you play with fabrics. So there's a lot of cut work. There's a lot of embroidery. There's a lot of techniques which have been passed down the generations and close to treasure. Again, I feel fashion is not something which is disposable, you know. Today, we kind of champion the cause of green fashion, of sustainable fashion, uh, fashion which is slow fashion. But these are all things that have been built inherently into us as Indians. So whether you look at the idea of the Kanjivaram sari, I mean, these are saris which last decades, you know, you don't have to do anything about them. You don't even need to wash them. So it's reapplying some of those uh, principles and philosophy to how we engage with clothes today. There was a collection called Kalahari, which was inspired by the beauty of the Namibian desert and the Kalahari desert and the Tuareg tribes and their textiles and taking it forward in again, assortment of, uh, uh, you know, techniques and textiles that we do. This may be interesting to all the finance people sitting in the uh, audiences. You know, in, in Holland, in the 1600s, there was a, uh, uh, you know, a phenomenon called tulip mania, where a single bulb of tulips was as much as a house in Amsterdam. And then suddenly the demand crashed. So it was, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting phenomenon, but we wanted to take the idea of the tulip being such a celebrated flower and then translating it into clothes. So like a cape like this, again, maybe say about 1400 hours plus of embroidery. But these are objects that you want to keep and treasure and hold on to in ways because they speak to you and they celebrate something which is the best part of life. This is a collection for which I won uh, the Woolmark Prize and represented India in Paris. So again, this was inspired by armor and these were all in a pure merino wool. But the idea was to kind of take wool, use entirely Indian craftsmanship and create garments that can be sold across the world. We've done also a bunch of Indian wear in this collection was called Millennial Maharanis, which was about the idea of the millennial generation who see themselves as modern day royalty because they have everything at their disposal and they really have the lifestyle that the erstwhile royalty had and how we took that forward. This is the collection called Utopia. This was an interesting story because this was after COVID. So two things happened during COVID. A, we had a lot of time to think. Secondly, we had a lot of time to feel depressed. 
in in the meantime i also had a baby girl so i think the culmination of all resulted in a certain freshness a certain lightness and the reinforcement of the idea that fashion essentially should be a tool to bring joy to your lives so light fabrics modern indian wear that you can kind of celebrate in rather than looking like you live in the wrong century i always say if you need two people to help you wear a dress honey you're in the wrong century there was a book again uh, written by an italian author on contemporary indian fashion and it feels good to represent the country and be one of the front runners of how indian craft is perceived in the world the british council gave me an uh, british council entrepreneur of the year award and that again was a milestone because uh, you know it it celebrated the the marriage of craft and commerce which is what are something i strongly believe in the woolmark prize i spoke about and a bunch of stuff that we've done over the years to kind of fly hopefully the flag of indian fashion wider and further we've been again if you see i mean what's interesting for me in this image is not the fact that the people are famous but the fact that this people across age groups and body types so you know you want fashion to be inclusive like i always when somebody comes to me and says you know oh i need to you know i need to go on a lemon diet for 3 weeks and then i'll come and buy a dress i'm like honey get the dress alter the dress later when you lose weight and if you lose weight so you know these old dictates of what is acceptable what things should be have to change with time that's across at buenos aires fashion week and you know it, it also was amazing because there's such a huge demand for people respond to indian fashion across the world you know i mean for them the fact that oh how is this done is this not a print it, it, so there is a massive audience is just connecting the dots to lead to them i also feel what you do as a designer is is you bring a certain point of view to the field of design so we've been very lucky to kind of apply that across disciplines to a multitude of products over the years we did a bunch of bomb you know bed sheets for bombay dyeing so this is a very interesting collection it was inspired by all the poisonous yet beautiful creatures that exist in nature so it was called toxin and those poison arrow frogs and the colors was something that happened for bed sheets there was one inspired by japan and then was one inspired by the roses from chiaroscuro we also done fine gems with uh, you know fine jewelry with uh, a brand you doing jewelry with diamonds and enamel as well as food so you, it's something which you really take across and apply so i think as a brand owner or as a brand custodian you know there's so many i'd love to do paint i'd love to do wallpaper i mean the the search is endless a diversion that happened through the years uh, again like i feel like there's something which is controlling us over and above what we choose to do or what we can control which is the idea of providence maybe so in 2010 you know uh, mrs bachan uh, uh, who i do personal clothes for in a personal wardrobe this called and said will you style a ad for us for a jewelry brand and that's how i stepped into the world of costume now what's very interesting about costumes is the fact that uh, you know uh, when you do fashion it's with a certain consumer in mind it's with a certain longevity in mind what you're doing through costume is you're telling the idea of storytelling through the clothes it's taking a known actor and converting them into a character so that the audience can step with greater realism into the world of that film that's what you're trying to do through costume so these are some of the work i've done with them over the years again marathi films happened luck by chance so you know i like i was speaking to you know uh, a few people before this talk began is it's just keeping an open mind and stepping into it you know where you uh, why not and i think that is a, a question if you can kind of ask yourself a lot more doors open than you know locking the door yourself and saying this is not me and that is not me with with preconceived ideas so there is a very cult marathi play called katyar karzat gusli which was being made into a film and they called me literally 3 weeks before filming and said you know will you help us with costumes and my first question was why me i mean like you know i had not done those kind of costumes till date but it just happened and that film was something which is still talked about and celebrated another marathi film happened which was a biopic on a uh, actor in the 60s and then uh, i ended up doing costumes for a film called tanaji the unsung warrior which was based on the maratha warrior tanaji malusare and uh, it was amazing because you know i think a film hinges on the creative vision of the director and what freedom he gives you to because you are talking of actors like say ajay devgan kajol saif ali khan who we've seen over decades in different avatars and how do you take them and make a film where you are convincing an audience for 2 hours that they are really in the 1600s and they are these people and they have these motivations and they have all of these thoughts that's where costume comes in because you're transforming actors into characters and this was a very in, 
it was a very gratifying project because I've always been a student of craft and a film like this just to kind of take you through the process and the numbers. So like these were the ideation boards of, you know, you're, you're talking about an era when there was nothing, right? there is no photography. So there is nobody who can prove or disprove how things were. There were paintings. So you, you, you know, it's really somebody's interpretation, but that's the closest that you'll get in terms of reference of how the world was. And you're, you know, really dealing with a country where there is so much craft and such an abundance of wealth and so much time that you're trying to tell in this short film world that you're trying to do. So this was for Tanaji and Savitri, who's, uh, you know, who are the lead pair. And those were what the costumes looked like. This was a very challenging character to do because, you know, uh, Shivaji Maharaj is somebody who's like God to a lot of Indians. And the, the great part and the scary part about doing a film like this is for, for decades from here on, this is what becomes a trademark for all the people in terms of how this character looked. So I visited museums in India and abroad. So we did Kelkar Museum in Pune. I went to Salar Jung in Hyderabad. I did Crafts Museum in Delhi, Calico in Ahmedabad, uh, you know, the uh, museum in Mumbai. Uh, the, I even pestered the people at the Victor and Albert Museum to open their walls and show me stuff that they had from the actual Mughal eras. And I can't tell you what a goosebump inducing feeling it is to hold a piece of textile that has actually been made in the 1600s in our country. And a project like this, I think what has been very, very gratifying is I was able to work with weavers and craftspeople from across the country. So whether it is we developed saris in, uh, in Dharwad, which were the Ilkal saris, we did Chanderi, we did Maheshwari, we did brocades. For the men, we looked at fabric, uh, Aurangzeb from all across the Silk Route. So whether it's ikats, it's brocades, there, were, there was realism, but there was also cinematic grandeur and beauty and both need to be balanced. For creating the jewelry for Kajol's character, we... I, you know, I traced down a jeweler who is in Kolhapur, whose ancestral family has been working with uh, the court of Shivaji Maharaj and creating jewelry from 400 year old molds. So we recreated pure gold jewelry using those molds and put it in the film rather than just going with a brand partner. Or there were people who worked with, you know, armor as it was done in those centuries and kind of brought all of that to the table. This was a sketch and that's of course how the film looked. I was very lucky to get the national award just two weeks ago for this. So that was a, I don't know. And what was most amazing is, is two things. One is the fact that uh, this award would not have been possible without the literally thousands of people who worked on the film. So whether you talk of the weavers, the jewelers, the craftspeople, also people who work on a set was one aspect because it just kind of makes you realize what a wealth of knowledge you have in this country and that we need to be proud of. Second thing was the fact that it also, I feel like films are such an influential medium that a film like this shines light on the abundance of heritage that we have. And in an era where there is so much of, you know, uh, globalization and which is a great thing, but there, it also kind of, we are probably one of the last few countries in the world where historic costume or even something which we take for granted like the sari is still relevant and worn today. And if it can bring attention to that at a larger level, I think that that becomes a very point of great influence. I've just finished work on this film called Adi Purush, which is a retelling of the Ramayana, which will be out next year. So we will chat about that more in detail then. Like I said, bringing joy to your lives. I've been always championing the handmade and the handcrafted, and that is what makes the clothes special. That is what makes the clothes something that you want to hold on to and not be disposable. We do stuff for brides and grooms and, you know, and another important thing that I really feel that sometimes fashion doesn't get is, you know, what are clothes? They, they, are, they are only of relevance if you wear them, if they are on your body and that's something. But most importantly, what clothes do is they are milestones of the important moments in your life. So you always, I mean, you know, you don't buy these clothes to, uh, you know, go grocery shopping in. I mean, you can, but you don't. So they are really for, you know, commemorating a birthday an achievement, a milestone, you know, like a wedding. And, and they become markers of that as you go along in the journey of life. You know, we, we, what are we? We are essentially uh, crucibles of memories, you know. And, and if fashion can be a, a, a tool to kind of aid and make that process more cherished, then that's something which I think is a, is a purpose well achieved. This is what we do with the brand. We've also, COVID has also been an important time for all of us to introspect. And it has really made me realize, which was perhaps at an informal level earlier as to how 
you know, alike we are as people. And as increasingly Indians kind of are spread out through the world, uh, whether it's a woman living in LA, an Indian woman perhaps, or somebody here, thoughts are similar, influences are similar. So we wanted to kind of use this period to take our brand to a larger audience. So we built the website ourselves. We marketed it ourselves. And that's what it looks like now. It, you know, it was a massive learning for me as an entrepreneur as well, in terms of, apart from the design aspect of it, the logistics, the, the systems, putting together a team for it, and a million challenges which continue every day. I mean, you know, like, so, but it, it's a very rewarding process to, for any creative person to, you know, have your product and your point of view resonated and validated by who you're creating it for. Democratic design to your doorstep. So I have always believed that, you know, fashion should be like a warm, big, happy embrace. We can't be, you can't sit with us and you can't do this and you can't do that. Now, I'll just illustrate this dress. So this is a dress from the new collection, which was worn by somebody who is living in Bombay, is a certain size, is a certain body type. And then very interestingly, these two friends, they both live in California. Uh, you know, her daughter was getting married in Tuscany. So they actually discovered us through Instagram and uh, you know, we did virtual e-consultations and they both the friends brought matching outfits to wear for the, for the, uh, one of their daughters uh, who got married in Tuscany. I mean, like geographical boundaries don't exist anymore. You know, Jimmy also said that. And I fully resonate with that thought because today I think if there are any boundaries, they're really boundaries of the mind. They're boundaries of ideologies. It, uh, the physicality is irrelevant. I mean, you know, we can be FaceTiming with somebody sitting in Auckland and at the same time on a group chat have somebody who's in Kenya. So it's really what are today we are forming our newer communities based on our thought process and our mindset. Now, this is an example of somebody who wanted to kind of, again, like each of these are handcrafted and made. So the, the stole on the right is made using, uh, you know, petany fabric, which is all pure gold zari woven in a part of Maharashtra. The others are embroidery, traditional thread work. So it's like a confluence of all cultures across the world being worn for a wedding. Again, we do like, you know, uh, Everybody come with us. So it's grandmothers, mothers and daughters. You know, it's, it's, I, I don't think when you see a lot of brands across the world and people always have this marketing fund, I know who's your target customer and is she this age and is she that age? And, and I think why not? I mean, you know, everybody's welcome. Whether it's for different occasions, different body types, different kinds of people. I mean, we are very lucky as designer. So my, like I said, my, everybody in my family is a doctor. And we do share people who know each, you know, we cater to in commonality. My dad always says, they call me when there's a problem. So it's a problem when their phone rings, they always call me for a celebration. <laughs> so I'm the lucky one. I always get calls when there's a happy thing going on. He always gets a stressful call regarding the same. Kids wear, why not? Couple capers. So, I you know, I said, while we are here talking to an audience and I don't want to kind of be the high preacher of fashion, I think. Uh, if there are a few, in, you know, takeaways that all of us can have from this in terms of how to style each other for a, uh, for a special occasion, how to be, you know, complement each other as a couple and not yet kind of match. I thought I'll take you through a few pictures and just, uh, you know, run you through ideas. So this was from that uh, first ad that I did. But again, if you see here, for a festive occasion, they're in the same color palette. Uh, her sari is actually a take on the Parsi Gara. And it is with embroidered all with ombre dyed silk ribbons. So the whole sari takes about, again, I think uh, 230 hours or something of embroidery to do, but it's a design classic. I mean, that's something which, uh, you know, as time goes by and as it, it's something you can wear. For me, nothing gives you more joy than a garment which is pulled out 10 years later and reworn because it's not only telling you the story of that garment, it's telling you the story of your journey through those 10 years. These are again couples that we styled, you know, in ways. So a lot of times people ask me, you know, hey, me and my wife are going for a wedding. Like, how do you want to look? I mean, you don't want to look like the Beckhams or twinning in head to toe, you know, I mean, like that, that's just not a fun look on Indians. But whether it's complementary colors, so we gave her a lovely plum color lehenga and he has got little plum color detailing all over the bangala and the pocket square. There's red and gray done in ways that works here. Again, like I said, for the same wedding. So the sari on the left was a very interesting brief. So this lady wanted a sari which complements. So the groom's family is from Gujarat and they are Maharashtrians. And she said, I really want to fuse the two. And me, obviously being a craft junkie, wanted to kind of, it was my, you know, manna from heaven because I wanted to kind of merge in as much as we could. So we took a lovely ikat and did the Gujarati Rabari mirror work. 
and with that you know draped it in a navari style so it was the first time that there was a confluence of these two styles done for her and for him again there were there was the patani stole and we did beautiful hand embroidered thread work popat so parrots on his kurta all over another couple who wanted something for a cocktail so he was much more outgoing and flamboyant so we gave him a fully hand beaded bangala kind of a jacket and for her it was a more tonal classy black outfit again here that's my wife <laughs> so as you can see so like it's black on black there is you know a sense of elements of what we are trying to do don't so just quick few tips if i had to kind of sum it up one would be that do not try and match exactly secondly a lot of people have this sense you know what is fashion or you know how do i kind of is this on trend like it's almost as if you know you're taking a prescription from a doctor and it's not you know trust me it won't bite you i mean at the most you'll go a little wrong so engage with fashion enjoy it maybe and for the idea of trends when you talk about i think trends are redundant there is a micro trend every second you can say oh pink is in fashion and then beyond say there is like a lime green and oh lime green is in fashion and something else happens so i'll come to this which is very important is this is one of my favorite quote so fashion's fade style is eternal i think the aim you know the fashion industry would want you to or has for decades wanted you to say oh this bag is last season and let's buy new season and let's buy this and let's buy that i'm going to take that idea and turn it around on its head and say hey you don't need to kind of uh, you know this what is being said develop something fashion is just a tool it's like you know it's like learning photoshop or it's like learning how to drive where that takes you is is your call it's it's a it's a decision you have to make you have to discover yourself through this process and this journey and understand what is it that is tickling your what is it that is making you feel most like yourself i mean you know because it works on like i've had women who've come before and said oh you know i have seen this xyz on a celebrity that you have made make it for me and i you know i have point blank refused because i'm like that works on her because she looks like that and that's her lifestyle her body type her skin tone and that's the best version of her what you need to do is like look like the best version of you and i think if that is a funda which can be kept in place when you're shopping it really helps another important tip i would say is you know it's it's a very simple tip but a lot of us don't realize we kind of are shooting things with a phone all day when you're stepping out take a picture of yourself head to toe in that outfit you know your eyes lie because if uh, this is exercise all of you can try is when you're looking you're only focusing on one point you can never see the whole image head to toe in one go and for that objectivity and detachment always take a picture of yourself to see whether, whether it works can take a front and a back see what is working on you and thirdly and most importantly i think buy less but buy better you know i mean i think this is something that uh, as we all go along in life you know we kind of look at with we settle into our own self but buy fewer nicer things make those things work really hard for you like this jacket i think is 5 years old but it was again inspired from the tulip mania collection which i showed you with the insects and the beetles and you know all of that but it's it works for me i mean it makes me feel great it's it's something so and i can mix it up i can dress it up dress it down wear it with a kurta so buy fewer nicer things buy things that you can kind of curate and make your own recipe for your own version of style i think that's really important and another important thing i would kind of say is you know be open to questioning like there's a lot of time when a lot of us fall into a style rut where we feel like there's only like this is what works for me and and every few years you know because you have changed you can't be the same person you were 5 years ago why should your wardrobe look the same so keep that in mind i mean there's enough of information online there's there's and designers don't bite we can you know we're always happy to engage and kind of uh, you know make you find the best version of what you do all work and no play so apart from fashion you know i thought i will just kind of give a little insight i think when we talk about the idea of a creative mind and a creative process i think you can't be doing things with a sense of agenda or wanting things a certain way and you can't prescript your life i feel as a design professional as a creative mind i'm like a sponge you know you just have to go through the process of life being open minded you never know what where inspiration strikes so if i was not doing this i probably would have been a wildlife photographer or a chef so that's the little the the chef part you can see <laughs> but the wildlife photography is what a little bit i thought i will kind of you know end you uh, end end my uh, talk with a little bit of what and i I've, i've always had nature be an important part of what i do as a designer as well whether it was a toxin collection or whether it was inspiration taken from flowers i think there is so much to look at so much to admire and so much to imbibe that you can never go wrong lastly i think i would like 
just kind of you know uh, summarize what I feel are important things as a designer that have been my learnings. So one very important thing is that you know essentially with any business and and you know there are larger ones and smaller ones essentially is about people and what you can whether you can have a positive impact on people people you are working with people who are consuming your product people who are getting inspired by what you do or people who just peripherally may be interested but are drawn into the fold of you know uh, the work that you do and therefore pushing the envelope so empathy is a very important quality i feel because you know you can never be a good designer if you're not empathetic so rather than kind of saying i you, you can't sit with us and oh, you need to lose weight and you need to be shorter and you need to be thinner and you need to be fairer and you need to be richer i think just meeting people midway and seeing what design can actually be a problem solving tool than mere lip service i think is really really important secondly i feel you know clothes have karma i mean uh, the clothes you wear they are touched by literally so many hands you know and that's something which we just kind of take for granted so whether it's like even like say a jacket like this i mean right from the linen being woven by somebody or even the farmer who has grown it from that stage till the fabric being made to dyed you know it's been finished it's been sold it's come to us we've done embroidery on it there's embroiderers involved there's people who have cut it stitched it it's really an ecosystem that is a part of it and you know and if as a business owner and as a creative uh, professional if that joy and sense of pride can percolate in your work all the way down to the last person i think it does amazing things for the product that you create it elevates the process as a whole and importantly when the creative economy is such an important part of our country's journey and trajectory it gives you a chance to contribute positively in that process in a small way as well as add that you know transfer that credit of happiness to the end user who's wearing it i mean you know i think that is what really the funda of or the the principle or the duty of good design ought to be i think we are in the business of happiness the product is in, is is a part of that and essentially uh, i feel you know as as we lead such insanely stressful insular self consuming lives if you can kind of step outside your own bubble and look at what you're doing with the detachment and seeing what kind of a footprint or thumbprint or impression it has on the world around you and if you feel your contribution can in any way make a more positive world for your generation and the next generation to live in i think it's a job well done thank you love the presentation lead to empathy design thinking your early days in paris mm. and i love the way you transcended indianness mm -hmm. into a world of global fashion we as entrepreneurs and professionals would love to know from you the entrepreneurial side of fashion mm. what do you think is the future of fashion in india for us to understand the industry just put a perspective because most of us uh, know about the fashion industry mm. but do not have a correct perspective to it who better to know it than from from a entrepreneurial point of view no i still feel it's a very like i said it's a very people oriented business i think the challenges that i see for it a is the sense of not enough knowledge and not enough pride in what we do so today also we end up consuming uh, you know indian fashion largely for festivities and events which kind of puts it into a smaller consumption category of course it's a open economy it's a open world we will be consuming the best of what there is but i think a sense of pride in what we do and kind of fueling that will be really important i think the second challenge that i really feel is a is a important one and uh, you know which may not be as apparent now but maybe in a decade or so is that the the wealth of craft that we have and which we have just taken for granted you know whether is the embroiderer or is the tailor at the corner who makes a perfectly fitted blouse for any woman anywhere those skills are not being uh, you know kind of encouraged enough those skills are not being supported enough and in a few years may just vanish and that's something which will be it will be far too late for that because i mean whoever i speak to even like say the employees we have you know and for me it's not just the employee but it's the whole family who we are supporting and we are proudly doing so but a lot of the kids don't want to do this like they have done it their fathers done it their brothers doing it but the kids want to maybe work in a mall or they see different kind of future aspirations for themselves and that is that is not a bad thing but when you look at say the atelier say in rome or you see in paris or you see in milan there is a whole new generation of people who are drawn into craft a because it pays well 
they have been inculcated with a sense of pride in their job and i think that's very important and unless we are able to do that here unless we are able to match the pay scale match their uh, lifestyle aspirations it's not going to happen appreciating local art and artisans so i think that that applies across industries even in the business of design hmm. fashion uh, indian artisans need to be supported and it's a whole different ball game i think a lot is happening better than what was happening 10 years back what i would love to know from you is what's the future of nachiket barve the brand what have you planned for yourself what so, are the milestones oh uh, you know i like to have a broader idea of what i'm doing and where i want to go but i have also learned over the last decade and a half that we've been doing this is it's not a good idea to over plan so i would kind of look at it more broadly and at a more emotional level rather than kind of break it down into xyz i think what i offer i believe has got a very welcoming and a widely applicable uh, user base so and you know even today i feel like those who understand fashion are already consuming fashion and those who want to consume fashion but don't know where to find their foot in the door or are too intimidated by it sometimes there's a very wide gap and if it can be via education and welcoming them into the fold where you feel like i think that's the way to grow a brand is by welcoming people into what you do so that's one definite step so whether it means having a flagship open reaching out online to as many customers as possible being able to retail across the world in various formats to uh, our audience and build that audience and on the costume side i think do the kind of films that i feel you know where costume tells is a is a key driver of the film and the story so those are the two parallel things but of course the brand is bigger than the, the costumes on the side put together so i was quite intrigued recently i got to see a entire film on pierre cardet mm-hmm. and uh, w- what an amazing journey not just fashion started mm-hmm. with fashion and moved on to furniture and moved on to interiors and art and mm-hmm. and theater yes so for you mm-hmm. apart from fashion do you think the brand moving into other aspects of uh, everything that we touch in our daily lives in terms of luxury 100% i think whether we talk about interiors or we talk about home decor we talk about uh, you know furnishing we talk about wallpaper paints you know it's a design mind so you yes. can apply to perfume you can apply it to food you can apply and i think it's challenging and i i get very easily uh, not easily but i i like to kind of be push to the corner in terms of what else what next you know i mean it's not it's boring to do the same thing i you know i mean though maybe the only reason i couldn't become an accountant it was far too structured and boring for me i mean i like to kind of push that envelope and open Keep the box fluid. yeah absolutely such an amazing talk with you such a pleasure to have you with us and i'm sure uh, if there are any questions would love to kind of take it from him before our next speaker comes on is there any questions yes please yeah. sir you quoted that you know style is whatever yeah is, yeah is correct important. style versus fashion but my question is there that you know how much should people be in fashion and if you are not in fashion what happens i mean just as a designer does mm-hmm. it bother you that someone is kind of looking different behaving different mm-hmm. whatever is not in fashion what's your perspective you know if you're not in fashion an asteroid comes and hits you <laughs> <laughs> no jokes the fact i think uh, you know fashion like i said is something which should be a matter of joy it is a personal choice and i think one thing that we have learned in the last decade as as the world kind of evolves and our thought process evolves is individuality is a wonderful thing you know so it's whether you are in terms of identity whether in terms of your politics whether in terms of all of us are individual and for far too long we've been kind of cloistered into sects into this into this is like so there was a time in the 50s when say somebody like christian dior would set the hemline for a season at a particular number of inches like 46 inches is the hemline for this season so if you didn't wear it you were out of fashion and there was a sense of homogeneity there was a sense of even today to a larger extent the white world informing us how we ought to dress and today as creative people who have a sense of pride and a sense of self worth we are constantly challenging those young people are challenging concepts of gender they're challenging concepts of what is age appropriate they're ch- challenging concepts of like i said mixing high and low so st- what is fashion fashion really is is a tool to express yourself stylistically so what we are talking about is style as a phenomenon where you want to express yourself i mean like you know in a city like mumbai like you see women you know who are and what i love about the energy of our city is you will see everybody is busy nobody has time to loiter on the street there are women who say you know uh, are doing household work 
as they for a living and they are the busiest because they have got like these four houses that they need to do and go home and pick up the children and they all primly dressed with their perfectly fitted sarees and contrast blouses and gajras and they are on a mission and you know that is style in its own expression so nobody today can tell you saying oh you are in or you are out it steps it stems from a sense of self worth a stronger sense of identity and having fun with fashion there's no asteroid be comfortable in your skin that's about absolutely it. thank you nachiket thanks a lot thank you question shift please go there are no wrong questions and there are no right questions i'm happy to answer all thank so. you uh, so my question is that uh, what are your thoughts about men fashion in specific uh, in terms of daily routine not uh, in terms of a uh, uh, event an event like a wedding or something for men's fashion for men's fashion do you feel that the spectrum of men's fashion has grown uh, in the given decades or uh, centuries or has it narrowed down gradually so it's a very interesting question you ask because when we talk about the idea of men's fashion it was very very elaborate maybe 400 years ago so men were wearing these big poofs and cloaks and you know every color under the sun and embroidery and jewelry so you look at the maharaj of patiala and he's wearing enough jewelry to buy maybe five residential buildings or 10 residential buildings so it's like it's really insane what happened over the years is it became boring and boring and boring to a point where all look like carbon copies of each other but in the last 5 years especially men's fashion has really found a voice because customers are asking for it they are okay with bright colors they are okay with prints they are okay with transparency they are okay with shine so i think that the the uh, gender walls have kind of shrunk or kind of disappeared you also have someone like an actor like say ranveer singh who really pushes the envelope on the on one end of the spectrum where you're like what was that for a lot of people but what that does is it kind of makes the average guy confident to wear like a rose print on a in a gray and a white maybe you know so men's fashion is definitely changing we do a lot of stuff for guys for grooms or otherwise also but again it's it's you have to take and leave you know like i look at fashion as a giant buffet at a indian wedding there's lebanese chinese italian chaat south indian everything is there you have to see what works for you thank you and last thing related to the same yeah. uh, when it comes to events uh, like wedding mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that men fashion is somewhere dependent upon women's fashion uh, just comes from an experience okay. uh, i <laughs> i uh, it's out of curiosity i i don't mind it but like when it was my wedding and i went out for mm -hmm. buying a, a shirwani for myself so it was like i went to sabya sachi let's say and the uh, she had an amazing dre dress mm. and when i said okay uh, what do you have for me wow. it was like a basic matching print uh, <laughs> to her so, dress so, and i was like am i an accessory over here or what so i will chime into that as having been married for over a decade i'll be a decade next year is that not just at the wedding but throughout the marriage you are the sidekick <laughs> once you accept that it's a happy marriage <laughs> that apart see i think you know with women there is still so much of you know it's a very elaborate process it's like building a space ship you know i mean it's like a massive massive process for weddings yes i still think grooms kind of are the complement to the bride and you don't want to clash you want to see it's also looking unified and today i think a lot of what how we dress has to do with the imagery we are creating you know all of us have become content creators so whether it is brides and grooms I mean, they are more interested in how their pictures look for their wedding instagram page then actually enjoying the wedding they're like mujhe angle chahiye you know it's like they're not interested so men's fashion but again with men's fashion i think the key is you know is to make it work for you is to have it make fashion a tool build it into a modular kind of a wardrobe so it becomes easy for every day rather than having to stress you know exactly. just build it like a wardrobe for events yes again you have to see what works on you if you're comfortable wearing bright colors and a very loud print more power to you but on most guys so again okay very very important dictate before we kind of uh, put to answer this L let you be the one wearing the clothes not the clothes wearing you so if you have a personality where you feel you're going to be able to dominate that outfit which is so loud great if not let let you be the center of attraction not what you're wearing thank you so much my pleasure thank you yeah so i have a question which is uh... for two individuals mm -hmm. one of you as a designer and one as nachiket the businessman mm. so i'm a part of the fashion industry my business is sunglasses and eyewear okay so you know you spoke about uh, identity becoming very fluid these days you know we have we don't have templates anymore uh, stuff Correct. like that so you know when you are designing something is are you designing something that you like and you expect people to wear that or you know in general because otherwise if you are templated then you can't be so very creative hmm. and if you are very you know fluid 
then you don't know whom you're targeting. So mm. it's a very you know difficult questions for us also these days. I love your question. I think you know uh, there's a uh, there was a very legendary fashion editor called Diana Vreeland who edited Harper's Bazaar and then Vogue for decades. Like she was the first uh, prima donna fashion editor who would command what the trends look like for the whole year. And she said, give people what they never knew they wanted. So if you give people what they know they wanted, then you're behind the curve. And if you you have to preempt it, it's it's intuition, it's experience, it's a lot of those things. Sometimes things land, sometimes things don't. So you have to be quick and responsive to also what is working and what is not working rather than having a preset notion. But you definitely have to push the envelope, especially today I feel, because you know, customers are evolving so fast that you cannot expect to to serve them something which which is a working formula, whether it's in the world of fashion, film, architecture, anywhere, and expect them to lap it up because they've already moved on to the next. And there as a businessman, I think it's also important to have a certain kind of budget or a certain kind of outlay towards design, development, and research because that that's the beating heart of your business. You know, I mean, otherwise it's just closed. Thank you.